Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Grant Schwartzwilder, President of OTA Environmental Solutions, uh, your host for Oilfield Strong webinar. Appreciate you uh, attending. This is like our 41st, I believe now. So uh, have uh, continued to have good traction with it. Uh, if you miss any uh, of this presentation or any of the past, we do have our YouTube channel uh, that you can pull up, uh, look under OTA compression and uh, you can source uh, any of the videos of any of the previous or this one, uh, if you wanna share with someone. Uh, th this is one that I've I always looked forward to because uh, I first met Robert early when we were doing these webinars. He was one of our first with a guy named David Fowler, who was president of Ring, and found him to be very informative. Uh, you know, sometimes you hear folks and they just say kind of all the, the plain legalistic type, but I actually learn things when I talk to Robert, which is uh, makes makes this presentation uh, much more enjoyable. Uh, Robert's president and CEO of Earthstone Energy. He's uh, really been, I guess, since what, 2013 with a predecessor and so uh, long history with the, with the company. So, uh, and then uh, I think collectively 30 plus years of, uh, as a petroleum engineer, A&D, management, kind of the whole gambit. So uh, uh, quite a wealth of experience. And so what we're wanting to do today is to talk about, uh, you know, the nice thing about Earthstone is that there seem to be in the press all the time doing uh, doing deals, whether it's financings or uh, acquisitions, done uh, uh, Bighorn Permian, uh, Chisholm, and then what, three or four other deals before that. So uh, over the last year, year and a half. And uh, so I wanna visit kind of two parts. One is the acquisitions, uh, but then second is kind of the integration. And, um, you know, so with that, Robert, welcome and uh, kind of throw this out that, you know, I, I, I've been hearing how it's hard to get deals done with price high. Now, some of these, I think you got done before oil price got to 120 and now you all look brilliant, uh, but, uh, but it seems like y'all figured out how to do, get acquisitions done. Is it because of stock, cash, overpaying? <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you don't have to admit a lot to, of deals by overpaying. Don't have to admit to any of those. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. So walk us through kind of, you know, and it looks like heavy on the Permian and heavy around your existing area. So if you'd walk us through kind of some of what, how y'all strategy been and how you've been able to implement that. Yeah, and, and first of all, thanks, Grant, and thanks to everybody for spending a little bit of time here. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, somebody else has said, hey, any press you get is good press, and, and some of that's true. Uh, in this business, we've created a lot of good press over the last 16 or 17 months, and our acquisition spree uh, is all based on our strategy of trying to get bigger. We're a public company, and we'll probably talk about a little bit of our ownership structure and it's a little bit unique from most public companies, not all of them, but uh, we do have some, uh, some large um, private equity types in our uh, equity. Um, but we had always knew that we needed to gain scale. And as a public company to get investor relevance, you, you've got to be bigger because nobody you know, pays attention to the little guys, even though they can be very efficient and create good margins it's just not a business that they can invest in. So we um, came through 2020 uh, in, in really great shape, shut down our programs, had great hedges in place, paid down a ton of debt, and for our size, ended up coming out of 2020 in, in, in fantastic shape, and it allowed us to be able to go on this spree of buying assets. Uh, our first deal was a deal we did announced at the end of 2020, which we've been working on for months. And it was very difficult then, totally different environment, but people were stuck uh, and, and unable to make decisions because of COVID and oil prices. And we found um, independence resource management after knowing them for a long time, uh, them to be constructive on a deal. And we acquired that asset Permian-based, Midland Basin-based, and that was our first, and it really set off a string of acquisitions. Um, in that deal, it was totally negotiated, so we probably overpaid. There was no process. Uh, we used equity, and um, the sellers are mostly uh, Warburg, 
um, and they took a bunch of stock at about four dollars and today we're trading at 14 so 16 months later they've got to be a happy investor and and i haven't heard otherwise uh, and we'll get to a little bit more of that in a moment i guess but <clears throat> so that was the first one and then there were a number of transactions in 21 that we worked on uh almost all of them marketed because the the environment had improved um the banks weren't under as much pressure uh companies were looking opp opportunistically to sell because you know prices had improved but not great we weren't we were still in a lower price environment uh and folks some of them needed a liquidity or it was time based on on events around their own funds uh we were not the high bidder in the next two transactions. In fact, we were the second or maybe the third bidder. And our ability to be constructive with a purchase and sale agreement in one case and use equity in that, in that same case uh, allowed us to win that deal. The other deal, we bought out a, a non-operated working interest partner and that was our Eagleford deal. It was our smallest deal. We didn't use equity, but the fact that we already knew the assets, we could close quickly and didn't need an agreement. It was very simple, just an assignment. Uh, and then fast forward, we had a company come to us and say, hey, if you, you, you just did Tracker, it's in Erie County for the most part, and we'd like to do a deal similar if you're of the mindset to do more. And again, that we used equity in that transaction. So um, if you fast forward, to our Delaware Basin deal. Um, that was a marketed process. Uh, we probably were the high bidder. Uh, for us, it was a very unique asset that fit some things that we were looking about. And I'll come back to that, or you can ask further. And then the last deal was Bighorn. We closed it in April, so just last month. Again, we were not the high bidder, uh, but our track record of closing deals, um, our ability, ability to show financi financing certainty to the seller uh, and our ability to move quickly on a PSA all created the, the opportunity for us to jump back in uh, and, and ultimately um, close or execute a PSA and then close that transaction. So it's a combination of track record, doing what you say, um, not having a bait and switch kind of attitude, uh, not worried about the last penny, you know, either way in a PSA, things of that nature. Well, and, and it seems like a theme through that I heard you mention a couple of times is the equity that you have public equity. And it looks like you've used that on most of your transaction. And if you didn't use it directly, you used it indirectly because it sounds like the pipes deal you did was obviously easier to do. I'm sure because you have a public, uh, so that seems to be a big advantage that you have in the marketplace is being a, a publicly held uh, stock, even if it wasn't a year and a half ago trading that uh, that well, it is, I assume it is now, or maybe yeah, not. Yeah, our liquidity, our trading volume has increased dramatically uh, over the past year. We now trade about a million shares a day, wow. and that has been helped by some of the deals where uh, we didn't lock up sellers. Uh, once our equity was registered for them to be able to sell it, they could. And some of those folks are out of our equity and goes into other people's hands. And that's great. It's, uh, there's, since there's not an equity capital market for us to go uh, use and raise funding that's in, in that source, we've used equity in transactions and it's dilutive, yes. And a lot of times we have a view that our stock price is gonna be much higher and every CEO thinks they're undervalued. And uh, we did not back off using it because it allowed us the scale that we've gotten to today. Um, and there's no other way we could have financed all of this given some constraints that we have, and that is managing a balance sheet to leverage that is low, you know, and, and, and peer leading if you look at certain sized SMID cap group uh, across the Permian or other places. Well, and, and when you say, it's always, and it, this might be a hard question for you to completely answer, but you talk about dilutive and you always think if you're not trading as much or your, your intrinsic value versus uh, trading value is going to be different. And then you, but you're willing to give the shares, how to think through that, because I assume now with more trading with the larger size, 
that gap between kind of what you think the value is and what the market's valuing should be narrowing, shouldn't it? Well, you would hope so, but it's still not. I mean, we're trading at 14 bucks and, you know, we ought to be trading double that um, from maybe a multiple standpoint. But again, says a good CEO. There we go. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, the way we've looked at it is we're getting a bigger pie. And yes, our shareholders are getting a smaller piece, but it is a bigger pie, more value. And ultimately, um, scale from a public company standpoint drives a trading multiple of some sort. And we hope to be trading, you know, not at three times where we are today in terms of a 22 EBITDA kind of number, but more like four times or maybe even a little bit higher. Historically, smaller companies have traded much higher than they are today. And we all know that, you know, the pioneers and the diamondbacks of the world are trading five, five and a half times. We, that's our vision to get to. Um, but, you know, the, it's a great target, but we also know that scale drives some of that and we just need to continue to drive uh, a bigger business. We, we talked about uh, some of the shareholders, so this might be a good time. NCAP owns, I think, 40, if I read it right, around 44% after the pipes. And then you have a couple other institutional. I look at it and it's like these uh, having large institutional, large private equity investors, that can either be a blessing because you can go and do a pipe still real quick and financial muscle, or it could be a challenge because now you got these big guys sitting there on your board kind of. I assume you've you've found it to be a positive, would be my guess. Yeah, um, uniquely so with NCAP. This is our third, Earthstone is our third entity that they have invested with us. Um, and we see it as a partnership and we've had a great partnership. Uh, in 2012, end of 2012, early 2013, we started out privately NCAP with seed capital and some uh, assets that we no longer have. They were scattered all over God's green earth. Uh, and then in 2014, we did a reverse merger and became Earthstone. It took over the Earthstone uh, entity and management. And NCAP's been a supportive investor all along. And um, Tracker, which we did in July of 2021, that whole transaction, Tracker by itself, plus a Drillco partner, NCAP owned about a quarter of that deal. They took shares. They wanted to take more. Uh, we just did this pipe. We announced it in January. We closed it April 14th. They took $220 million of new equity invested into Earthstone. So to me, it's a vote of confidence on our strategy, uh, our management team, our operational excellence. Um, but it, it also is a huge burden that we've got to perform. And uh, they like the track record we've created. Uh, and they also think we've got good runway to continue to create value or else they wouldn't have put this latest fresh money into the business. But, we also, just so, you know, fair commercial to everybody, uh, we've got Warburg in here and now we've got Posto. Warburg, like I said, first deal was in, closed in January of 21. The Chisholm deal that we closed, which is the Delaware Basin deal we announced in December, closed in February. Warburg was a was an owner in that as well with some other parties, and uh, again they took equity. So again, vote of confidence in what we were doing, uh, and then Post Oak came alongside of NCAP uh, when we did that transaction. And actually, from an arm's length negotiation transaction standpoint, it was really Post Oak and us uh, negotiating on the price, and NCAP came along for the ride. Uh, and in fairness. Post Oak put up $60 million, NCAP put 220, and then Post Oak bought a few shares from NCAP uh, to give them a bigger percentage. So uh, at the end of the day, those three firms hold 67% of the equity or thereabouts, and the rest is you know public investors or management and, and board members. So if one private equity group is good, three is better? Uh, yeah, this is gray for a reason. It's, you know, if one kid is good, five is good. That's partly why I have gray hair. If uh, one private equity is good, three is, these three guys get along very well. And, and they're all represented, the companies get along well. They're all represented on the board and long relationships with them and, and that amongst them and with us as well. So that helps. 
Well, I'm I'm gonna sit you up to make some uh, some news here and uh, or let you dance a little bit. But I look at all these acquisitions and it's all in the Permian, except for a little bitty guy over in South Texas. Are are you trying to become a a Permian focused company? Are you basically you are. It seems like to me. <laughs> yeah, we we are definitely not spending any capital in the Eagleford. Uh, we've had a long presence there. Uh, goes back to 2000. 10 or nine when we started putting leases together in our prior company. Um, and I love the Eagleford. Um, we looked at a lot of deals in 2020, 2021, even previously in the Eagleford. We just couldn't find that right deal. Um, no offense to the Eagleford. If you're in the core, you can have great economics and they're resilient. The Permian has more opportunities at lower prices. And when we started looking around as to where we would want to expand, it was it was sort of a no brainer, um, and and we love the Midland and the Delaware Basin and the economics there and the resiliency. So, you know, at, at, over time we could exit our Eagleford position because we're just not going to focus any more time from an, a, an acquisition standpoint and don't have any drilling opportunities there. So, yeah, I was giving you the opportunity to announce that you're going to sell all that when you kind of. <laughs> went a little ways there. So, so let's flip over now to the integration side and, and, you know, throughout your uh, press releases and all you talk about reducing operating costs, uh, proximity, people, scale, but it seems like one of the biggest drivers is simply the scale that you have by being larger than you can spread that cost out of administrative to everything else among more barrels. Is that, it, with all this integration, is that the biggest driver of economics is just simply scale? Or, and I know there's some other things, but uh, how's that fit in? Yeah, it, it definitely helps. You know, you got, you got 10 barrels over two people, whatever that dollar amount is, or 10 barrels over five, and you continue to reduce your sort of fixed administrative cost, right? And so that is very helpful and, and and really we've driven down that number a lot. You go back several years and we were at 10 bucks uh, cash GNA plus LOE. And this year, you know, it's a it's going to be elevated a little bit with these two new acquisitions being a little bit higher cost, but last year we were under eight dollars. So every barrel we add, you know, gets spread across, you know, more bodies. Of course, our GNA is higher on an absolute basis, but on a per BOE basis. That's one. The other thing is, as you get a certain size, you can um, have a little bit better pricing power, um, or you can have sustainability in a program, a development program, drilling program, which helps get you some efficiency on the cost side and just the operational efficiency, which helps drive down your costs, or at least in this environment, maybe it keeps your costs flat um, uh, because there definitely service cost increases are, are pressuring all of us and no one's immune from that. So it, 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 it is helpful. Um, we've been able to spread out people uh, across a larger asset base and giving them authority and accountability to do their job with certain guidelines. Um, we, we don't micromanage and it allows us to have less people um, we took over a couple of assets. One of had, you know, three or four um, lease operators or pumpers, and it wasn't that many wells. And our guys, we didn't need any of those po folks. They were all contract anyway. And our guys just took it over, and we didn't add any bodies there. Uh, in each of the acquisitions we've done outside of that one, we have maintained some continuity by hiring the field staff and some certain uh, members of the uh, of the uh, office staff as well. And that consistency goes a long way in helping us um, continue uh, appropriate operations and being efficient in the field. So much of your activity out in the Permian, but then your corporate office is there in the Woodlands. Have you, with those acquisitions, have you seen more of a shift of personnel out there and thinning in the Woodlands on a relative basis? Or how do y'all balance? Because I see a lot of companies that have a corporate office in one town, but most of their activity is in, you know, South Texas or West Texas. Yeah, we do have an office in Midland. Um, it used to have six people. It's probably got 12 or 13 now, and it's probably going to grow by a couple more. Uh, it's, it's operational heavy, as you would expect. Um, we have operations folks, though, here in Houston as well, or the Woodlands. 
um, both on the drilling and production completion side. Uh, our, our reservoir team is here. Our corporate side of the business is here as well, uh, as well as some ge geologic and land um, leaders and functions are performed here as well. So it's spread out. Um, I, I, we, we started in 2017 and took over Bold Energy. They had an office in Midland. We made a concerted effort to keep that office and committed to uh, increasing the number of bodies in that office while, along with our activity. And we've done that over the last you know, several years now. So I love having a presence there. Um, with Bighorn, we actually picked up a presence in San Angelo because part of their operating team is there. Uh, it, their field operations team is there and we, we've hired a lot of those folks. And I'm looking forward to getting over to San Angelo and meeting them. Um, the New Mexico side of it, uh, it's spread out. Uh, we don't have a concentrated base anywhere. We've got kind of two bases of folks. Uh, we've, we've got, we don't even have a field office. Those guys do a lot of work out of their truck or their home. So, um, which, you know, you got to love that. Definitely. Well, and that brings up a point about New Mexico that, you know, with all the additional regulation over the last uh, six months, year, you know, I've got a bunch of people that say it's great opportunity and a whole lot that say we're going to get the heck out of here uh, because it's just, it's a tougher regulatory environment. Uh, I assume y'all, since y'all been kind of buying some things, y'all are in the, the first camp. We definitely are. So if you've got people who are tired and weary of playing in New Mexico, um, send them my way. Okay. Uh, we'll be glad to pick up their assets. Um, look, our team uh, has spent a lot of time working in, on federal acreage in other entities over the years. I've worked in you know, Wyoming and North Dakota and dealt with federal issues. Um, the beauty of it is there's a process. Maybe it takes a long time, but there is a process and you just got to get in the process and know that if you're going to change something that it, you better have a backup plan. So it takes a lot of planning, uh, you know, forward thinking about what next year is going to look like. We're already doing some planning for next year. Uh, we already have enough permits we could drill next year, but we're thinking about larger pad size and things like that. So we got to make sure that we're well ahead of, you know, where our rigs are going. Um, so we didn't shy away from it. Um, we, we spent a lot of time talking to people who were not selling in New Mexico, but were operating there to try and make sure that we weren't stepping into something that was an issue. And what we heard was a early in the administration, uh, people were a little bit nervous, but as time went on, the agencies and the local offices didn't change their procedures and timelines. And so it was sort of business as normal. Okay. Well, to speak further about integration, is there any additional insight on kind of when y'all do this acquisition, you know, kind of how you're trying to integrate that in? Obviously, you've got to worry about the people in the field. Uh, so there's kind of a certain number of obvious things, but uh, have you found now that after five deals, you should have this figured out by now. And how, <laughs> it's, uh, have you found some things that were kind of more critical or, or harder through this process or through the um, yeah. processes? The people side of it is the hardest. And if you can um, win over the field guys to come into a new organization uh, and, and show them that, you know, we're pretty good guys. We've got a good reputation. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of people you can call and check us out. That goes a long way. And then creating a culture or letting them come into the culture that we have that allows for um, respect among employees, supervisor to, you know, staff or whatever, but also accountability and responsibility and let, let people do their job versus micromanaging. And, you know, it's not some ivory tower telling them how to pump their wells. You know, it's a guy locally and in communication, they determine what the best way to run that route or whatever it is. So that's one side of it, the people side, and that's a big side of it. Um, and then the next is systems and making sure that you've got systems in place, whether that's production or engineering systems or you know, drilling reporting systems or all the way to accounting systems um, that can handle the increases that you get. And quite frankly, um, 
we've been fortunate that our systems are able to expand and grow. And in one situation, uh, the selling company system was better than ours uh, in, in terms of some of the production um, tools. And so we're gonna integrate our entire company into their system ultimately. Uh, and, and we're gonna you know, take over their system and then integrate ours into it. So um, you know, to me, that is another big key. So, and then lastly, the execution part, if you've got a rig program going, man, when you step into the driver's seat of that program, I hope you've had some time as a passenger uh, and you've got the experience. One of the acquisitions we did, we didn't get very many of the operating office staff. We were fortunate that we could go out and hire drilling engineers, production engineer, uh, geologists and land guys who are focused on a particular area and come into the organization and had the experience in that area and just picked up where, you know, the, the after the end of the transition agreement we had with the seller uh, and didn't miss a beat. Well, obviously that, that had to have been a year or two ago if you were able to hire all those people. So, uh, <laughs> it might've been a month or two ago. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, good yeah. for you then. It's, yeah. uh, that's, that's saying something because finding people right now is a challenge. It is. Um, I'd be amiss if I didn't ask about ESG and environmental. Um, let's talk from an acquisition standpoint have you seen the due diligence or the the metrics that you've used for acquisitions changed or have have or how is that the the evolution of ESG has that tracked anyhow how you're doing your acquisitions um it is becoming more prevalent in the way we look at acquisitions but we're not going to let it drive the acquisition if we have to go out and fix stuff after a deal we'll go do it we'll get things either up to our standard which is above compliance or at least to compliance levels as fast as we can fortunately for us we've been buying assets in areas that have good infrastructure and you know, so we've got pipelines and we're not sitting here flaring wells. Um, and we've got relatively new facilities that are equipped appropriately to handle, you know, like VRUs or um, air for pneumatics and things like that. So, you know, we've, we've got the right um, platform in place internally. And then when we look at assets, if we have to go expand or have to spend some money, we're willing to go do that, but we're not gonna make that an ultimate criteria at this point, say, okay, well, if your ESG score is an X, we're not even gonna look at you because there's some opportunity there. So. Okay. And then, then once you have it integrated and kind of going forward, talk about processes and systems, ESG is all about that. So uh, assume you've had to kind of beef up that just to be able to do the reporting and do the compliance going forward? It, it is getting bigger as a role within the organization in terms of um, the, the compliance and the reporting. Um, and there's gonna be more pressure on companies and we're actually gonna have to hire a couple of people related to the environmental or ESG side of the house just because of what the SEC is gonna you know, make public companies. And sooner or later, it will fall into private companies, I suspect. Uh, or those who want to sell are going to have to live up to the same standards. And so it is a, a bigger portion of our business going forward than it has been in the past. And we're dealing with it real time and we don't have it, we don't have it all fixed yet. Yeah. Now we've seen that also where if, uh, even if you're private, if you're ultimately going to sell, it's most likely to a public or a uh, private equity backed, which has those issues. And so you kind of have to act like you're public because so you can exit. Uh, so yeah, I, I would agree that it's going to flow flow all the way through to the private side. Yeah, the Chisholm guys in the Delaware Basin did a great job of reducing flaring uh, from like, we'll call it 2020 to 2021. And that was um, very important to us to see that they had made big strides. It made it easier for us because the next step is going to be, you know, less low hanging fruit and, you know, advancing technology, using some of the advanced technologies versus trying to fix 
flaring issues that they had in the past, and and they they did a good good job of reducing flaring over the past year and a half. Are y'all looking at using or are you using kind of continuous monitoring, uh, fixed wing flyovers, all those type of things, or are you? Well, we'll leave it at that. Are you using? Yeah. That? <laughs> we are evaluating, and yes, we are in the process of using some of those tools and trying to figure out what makes sense for us. You know. We've always been environmentally responsible. We as an industry have been horrible about reporting it uh, and we're doing a lot better about that. And, and yes, there were times where we were flaring a whole bunch of gas because we didn't have infrastructure. Now some of that's caught up. Right. Um, but we at Earthstone are not going to be the leader in you know all these environmental technologies and put them on every location. We're going to be a follower and make sure that somebody else has tested these all out and try and figure out the most practical way for us to uh, evolve our, our environmental side of our business. It's always a challenge to be a leader, especially in a marketplace that doesn't really know where it's trying to go, <laughs> that uh, you can, you can lead down there. And then if they change the trail on you, you're, you're going to be, have lost a lot of time or money. That's so right. I think that's very wise to let the, uh, the market come to you to some degree on that so last question and because we're reached our time but i always wonder anytime you talk about acquisitions it's always you got a hedge now that's if you're using a lot of bank debt or you know private equity we all are different to some degree but i but maybe in cap and all these others have suggested that you hedge what's been y'all's attitude on that for your acquisitions and and has the pressure come from the bank side or the private equity or the public equity side or, or just a policy that you've had? Yeah, it's a good question. And we're probably a little unique in that we've been, we view hedging as a discipline and we just do it sort of matter of course. When you're smaller, uh, you have more debt um, and you're still spending capital, you probably need to be hedged more. And going into 2020, we were about 80% hedged on oil with some very nice hedges that paid out millions of dollars and helped us pay down a bunch of debt. Uh, we were in the same way in 2021, except we wrote a lot of checks. In fact, probably more than what we got paid for in 2020. But again, it was a disciplined approach of, hey, let's be hedged. Today, we're 50 to 60% hedged on oil and gas. Uh, we're a much bigger company. Uh, we've got more resiliency if oil prices crash. Um, you know, we're, we're free cash flow positive, even though we've got four rigs running. Um, so that, you know, isn't a concern. Um, we could always cut back on capital if oil prices go down. So we, we're in a little bit different position today, but we continue to look at, you know, out in the future. Um, we have no demands from our banks to hedge around a revolver redetermination, things like that. We did agree both in the Chisholm and the Bighorn acquisition to do some hedging on PDP volumes. We were already far enough down the road with our own hedge program that we didn't have to do a whole lot, um, but we agreed to get to that 50% level and we were so close, we wasn't really agreeing to a whole lot, it wasn't much of a give. So I, I believe that you know we're in the business to some degree of risk mitigation and we view hedging as, as that. I mean, you tell me if it's bad, if I can get a six by $12 costless caller on gas or a 70 by 105 on oil, man, I'll take that risk of, I can't get more than 105 bucks for my oil every single day. And 70 is a pretty nice floor and we can still make really good economics drilling wells at $70 oil. Yeah, no, if you're in that range, you're you're good. It's uh, there's a few out there that have uh, maybe would love to have that type of range. So well, not uh, all of them are there. I'll tell you that. I'll be honest. That you know we've got some that are in the fifty-five or sixty or sixty-five dollar range uh, swaps. But what we're doing now is costless callers. Yeah, well, and fifty percent, you still got plenty of exposure. So you're, I think you're doing just fine. It sounds like. Well, Robert, thank you very much. I want to keep. Uh, um, to our promise of 30, 35 minutes. So uh, uh, thank you very much for the insight. Uh, always enjoy visiting with you and uh, learn something. And that's been the case again. So uh, I just disappointed that I didn't buy Earthstone at $4. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but it sounds like I still need to buy it at 14 and I'll still have a chance. There you to go. Me. There you go. There you go. How about yep. that for hawking a stock? So uh, great. All right. Thanks, Thank you, Robert. Thanks everyone.